Hello and welcome to Asasaba, a podcast that honors oral tradition and shines a light on Ghanaian stories that are often untold or silenced. I'm your host, Michelle, and my pronouns are she and her. Welcome back, everyone. I want to thank everyone who has been engaging with the podcast, like especially on Instagram, you know, answering all my little questions and stuff like that. (laughs) It makes me happy. And that's one of the ways that you can actually support the podcast through sharing, through following on social media, engaging on social media. And Asasaba is on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at A-S-A-S-E-B-A-P-O-D. Also, tell your family about it. Tell your friends. Tell whoever, right? Support the podcast by sharing it with whoever is in your network or your community. I really appreciate when you guys do that. Another way to support the podcast is through monetary donations. I'm the sole producer, editor, planner, interviewer of the podcast. And if you want to support me as an indie creator, you can do so by donating. And you can donate via email transfer for those in Canada. And if you're outside of Canada, you can donate via PayPal. And the email for that is ASASE. B-A-P-O-D at gmail.com. That's a sasabapod at gmail.com. Thank you so much for your support. I love it. I love it. I love when y'all engage with me. So makes me really happy. So yeah, this episode is another history episode, you know? Like, I am a history girl. I love just like going on YouTube and watching videos of you know, the elders discussing history, like the oral history. Um, I love reading like, you know, articles or journal articles or whatever about like pre-colonial stuff, listening to podcasts about like, you know, when I can find them, like I, I love listening to podcasts about like history. So yeah, I'm a history girl. So it makes sense. I'm going to bring you history on this podcast. <laughs> Anyway, today is an interview episode, and we are talking about pre-colonial Ghana with our guest, Herman. And Herman, pronounced he, his, is an assistant professor of African art history at the University of Illinois, Urbana, Champaign. And he joins us to discuss pre-colonial Ghana, and we dive into the time frame, if pre-colonial Ghana is romanticized, what we can learn from back then, the limitations of written and oral history, and much, much more. I know from Instagram that a lot of you are interested in pre-colonial history. A couple of weeks back, I actually posed a question and asked, like, what would you like to know about pre-colonial history? And this is it. This interview isn't like a direct response and all the um, answers that I got, but I feel like it's a good primer, a good general overview of it. And I definitely want to do more pre-colonial history episodes later on in the future, whether it's like other seasons and stuff. But anyway, you know, I'm glad that uh, we have this here today. And for people that are interested, I know a lot of you are. So, yes, let's get into this episode. Hi, Herman. Welcome to Assassiva Podcast. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah. Hello. Um, my name is um, Herman von Hesse. And um, I'm from Ghana, same as uh, Michelle. And I'm an assistant professor of African art history um, here at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And um, I I have a PhD in African history with a minor in art history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Yeah, um, I started teaching here in Urbana-Champaign. Um, this is actually my first semester. Passionate about everything, African history, African art history, and African material cultures, and you know, social and cultural history more broadly. Nice, I love it. Speaking of history and African history, so today we're going to be speaking specifically about pre-colonial times in Ghana, 
So before we launch into that, what time frame, when we talk about pre-colonial Ghana, what time frame is considered pre-colonial Ghana? Yeah, thanks. So um, so the term pre-colonial is so imprecise and is fraught with so many conceptual uh, problems because pre-colonial or colonial starts at different points in in African history, right? Even even in Ghana, uh, at the time that the Gold Coast or what is now coastal Ghana um, became a British colony, was different from. I mean, it came much earlier than when uh, places like Asante and the Northern Territories came under British rule. So at the time that the Gold Coast was under colonial rule, Asante was still pre-colonial, right? And also um, at the time when most of Africa was pre-colonial, places like um, the Cape in South Africa uh, had already experienced a Dutch colonial presence, a Dutch settler colony, right? So when you say pre-colonial, uh, it depends on which part of Africa you are talking about and which time period, right? So there's not really any uh, specific time when when you want to talk about colonial or pre-colonial. But, uh, but generally, the, the pre-colonial is usually any time, for the most part, it's any time before 1870. But it's also important to know that Places like Algeria had already had French occupation as far back as 1830, and 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 also like this the South African example that I gave, right? So uh, it depends on which part of Africa you are talking about and which time time period. Um, but also um, one of the problems with this categories is is the fact that we assume that when we say pre-colonial and the transition away from that we we assume that uh there was an there was a european magic wand that completely changed africans from being something you know from being um something completely different from what preceded the colonial but it's but it's important to note that uh, even in pre-colonial times, Africa was still interacting with Europeans. And before Europeans came to Africa south of the Sahara, you know, the continent was, you know, interacting with other parts of the world through long distance trade and so on, right? When the colonial era began, it was just a culmination of different external influences and connections right so so uh, the transition to the colonial era was not simply a transition to something to a world which was completely different in many cases it did not it wasn't until the 1920s and the 30s that uh, Africa became so different from what it, it was, say, in the 1870s or 1880s or even the early 1900s, right? Because and a lot this of- this specifically applies to Ghana, right? I just wanted to make sure, like, Ghana, on Ghana spe specifically. Ghana, yes, Ghana and several other African countries. No, I just wanted to, 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 to put Ghana in that perspective, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I definitely understand. I know that like, for example, the Portuguese step foot um, where we would classify as Ghana today in the 1400s, I believe. So as you mentioned, we've kind of, we have a history of interacting with the Europeans, whether it was like when during, you know, during that time when we were trading with them, et cetera. But I guess what you're saying is that the relationship shifted as time went on prior to that kind of formal 
colonization period, we were still kind of interacting with them, but not in the way that we think of when we think of colonization. Exactly. So, so, so simply put, uh, Africans had sovereignty and Europeans lived at the mercy of Africans. And I want to summarize it with um, historian Tom, Tom McCaskey's very interesting phrasing that initially uh, the British asking and then they persuaded and eventually they commanded, right? So, so, so this sums up, you know, our sort of interactions with Ghana's interactions with Europeans until um, the, the the second half of the nineteenth century, uh, particularly um, by the eighteen seventies, when power drastically shifted in 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 favor of of Europeans, and then eventually um, by the end of the nineteenth century, um, Asante and the Northern Territories were. Were, were brought effectively under British colonial domination. Okay. And when we refer to pre-colonial Ghana, I guess you already touched on this. I was going to ask, what are we referring to? But I don't think you need to go into detail. And I think you kind of covered that with the previous question. So thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Um, I know just going on social media or reading content, certain content by different people, Googling pre-colonial Ghana, some people tend to romanticize or generalize what pre-colonial Ghana looked like. So in your opinion, do you think that's something that people do? And why do you think they do that? Or if you don't think people romanticize pre-colonial Ghana, um, what's your perspective on on that? I th- I think um the romanticization of pre colonial Ghana and by extension pre colonial Africa was, it was something that started even um right at the onset of colonial rule. I mean, it's just like um in twenty twenty two when people are saying that oh, um, the economy is bad, Nanado is, is not delivering on his promises. And then people will look back to uh, when President Mahama was president and, and then they'll say, oh, um, you see, um, President Mahama was ter- was great. You know, everything was fine and all of that, right? Um, so this romanticization of pre-colonial Ghana comes out of this these discourses of very politicized Africans who were agitating against all the racist, you know, colonial policies and of colonial exclusion, right? So um, it's important to note that uh, the romanticization of pre-colonial Ghana was an important political tool that uh, nationalists who wanted to um, reorient Gold Coast Africans and to give them a sense of nationhood, you know, they 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 went back and um, picked up these stories um, as a way of forging a sense of national cohesion against what was thought as, um, you know, European domination or or against European domination. You know, the Gold Coast was not. A nation. The term Gold Coast was a mere uh, geographical description. And it's there were several nations within that within the Gold Coast, right? So back in the day, if you say the Gold Coast, it's just like saying West Africa, like it was it was a region, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it was British, it was the, the the proclamation of the Gold Coast Colony and Protectorate in 1874 that uh, really made that really transformed the Gold Coast from a mere geographical region to a colonial state. And then in 1900, uh, Asante was you know conquered and made a crown colony. And then the Northern Territories was also you know brought under British rule, right? And right. then um, by the 1940s, um, all of these territories would be centralized. Um, and then 1957, we got independence, right? So there are lots of 
uh, myths that nationalist myths that were were created to sort of you know glue this uh, patchwork of different nations and people with different languages and different histories uh, together. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for noting that because that's so important because there is no one singular and there was never one singular Gold Coast or pre-colonial Ghana because there were so many different ethnic groups, different languages, different sort of conflicts going on before we became Gold Coast or before we became Ghana as well. You know, a lot of imperialism, like, you know, things going on between the different groups in Ghana. So it wasn't just, it wasn't like a unified group of people. There was so much going on. So thank you for pointing that out. Because yeah. I think that I mean, we were some people may not know. Yeah. We and were we were different, different, yeah, different nations yeah, and different, different nations. groups. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, we, I mean, I mean, we intermarried. I mean, but I mean, it's just like in, in, in Europe, right? Um, there were different European groups. They intermarried, but they fought and killed each other a lot, right? I mean, basically, mm -hmm. it was the same thing we were doing. On the other hand, what do you think we can learn from pre-colonial Ghana or pre-colonial what is considered Ghana today? And how can we apply it to our present day? I know I don't want to like paint it like a general pre-colonial Ghana, but just for lack of a better, a better term. Um, how can we learn from our past and pre-colonial Ghana? Yeah, I mean, um for me, what what I find um fascinating about pre-colonial Ghanaian nations cultures is that like whenever I delve myself into their cultures honestly I find them I find them very strange because um the past is a completely different world even though there are continuities right um but but you asked me about positives so I'll I'll dwell on that um <laughs> I, I, I think I think I think their architecture is as one thing that I'm really really interested in. Um, these days we talk about sustainable architecture and uh, going green and all of that, but there are um, two story buildings uh, made of adobe mud mm -hmm. still standing in old Accra, Cape Coast, uh, and, and and parts of the you know fancy speaking world right on along the coast and. Um, some of these have been standing for over 160 years and, and they are still there, right? I wonder what material science engineers are doing, you know, and and I feel a lot of architectural training at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology have not lacks um, historical that there's a lack of historical component to 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 these kinds of technical training and 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 a lot of our sort of pre 20th century crafts you know are just um the knowledge is just going away like the knowledge is disappearing so so as somebody who is an architectural historian like a material a historian of material culture and cultural history more broadly, cultural social history more broadly. Uh, for me, um, these are one of the, I mean, these are some of the things that I would advocate that we 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 look into. For me, like I'm really fascinated by a lot of their, you know, material cultures and 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 how we can adapt that to a lot of our uh, discourses about going green or sustainable architecture and, and 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 things like that, right? And 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 all these ideas. I mean, these are not things that Europeans invented. Uh, I mean, in 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 the twentieth century or in the twenty first century. But 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 if if somebody in in coastal Ghana can live in like a two story adobe house with all our our technology, why can't we reproduce that and transform it into you know something more more durable you know i mean we talk about 
the, the, the rising cost of um, building materials. So these are things that we can, we can, we can learn. I mean, we can, we can learn from. Yeah. yeah. That's super interesting. And it makes me think of even our educational system pre colonization or di the different ways that we learned I recently did an episode where I talked about the Basel mission and how, you know, today they are known for, you know, quote unquote, bringing schools to Ghana. But the thing is, we had our own educational systems and way, our own ways of passing down knowledge. And I know you mentioned like certain ways of doing our crafts. And, you know, I learned, you know, we had different ways of our trades, like whether maybe like basket weaving, for example, or like drumming or any of our traditional customs and traditions, there are, there is sort of like a, a training system to it, or even the spiritual, different various spiritual systems within the different ethnic groups. So I think, I guess another component is also probably learning about our traditional customs and traditions and seeing what we can use today or how it can evolve but yeah thank you for bringing that up in terms of like our architectural buildings and stuff like that I think it's definitely useful to see to go back and see what we can bring with us today yeah but one one thing that I want I also wanted to point out is that um our ancestors were were also our pre-colonial ancestors were not against borrowing ideas from Europeans, you know. In fact, those who were, you know, Gold Coast merchants who started building, they first started building in, in stone uh, because uh, stone could better protect imported merchandise that they were trading. And also they figured out a way to um, innovate or to transform their single story mud houses into double story houses, right? So even if you cannot build in stone, you can still build durable mud houses using Adobe like sun dried bricks. They were always able to expand their cultural repertoire in ways that made economic you know, and even political sense, right? The grander your house, the more your political clout also also grew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we did share ideas, or we yeah. did take you know some European ideas back in the day and applied it to our context and what made sense for us. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, and and, and cultural exchange to, um, you know was not a one-way traffic, right? I yeah, mean, definitely. Europeans, you know, Europeans were dying in their numbers. Life expectancy for Europeans um, in most of the Gold Coast, uh, particularly in Accra, was just one and a half years. So Europeans were consulting local shrines. Uh, their local wives were giving them um, all kinds of herbal concoctions to cure malaria, black water fever, you know, and all, all, all kinds of tropical diseases. Um, they were eating local food and they were taking local wives because if you don't do that, you wouldn't live long, right? Because a, a lot of the time, the, those Europeans sitting in their forts, they were drink, they were just drinking too much and um, because they were bored most of the time. Um, so it's, it's also important to point out that there were cultural exchanges and then our ancestors were not traditional in in the sense that they were they had cultures which were very dynamic right and that they borrowed um foreign cultures to to suit their own cultural contexts yeah so it's, it's very important to um point out some of these um, dynamics as well yeah yeah i guess that points to the nuance in the way that we think about history because I know that, you know, today's today it's easy to kind of make things it either went this way or that way, but there is some sort of nuance in how certain things work. Like we can acknowledge 
you know, power differences and how things evolve throughout time. But I guess it is important to note that this, the way that we may have interacted with these Europeans, there might have been some nuance to it. And it's hard to kind of think of things in that way today, especially with like how everything is set up right now, you know, white supremacy, all that kind of thing. So that kind of, you kind of answered my question about what are some things people would be surprised to know about pre-colonial Ghana. And that's like that cultural exchange part of things. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's funny because a lot of the time people think about the past based on how things eventually panned out. We think about the past, about how things panned out and how we see things in contemporary times. But they don't think about the past through the lens of how things started and how um, power relations were not necessarily like what they became subsequently, right? right. So when you do history by looking at what things became rather than looking at what things were, you will get a lot of things wrong. So so a lot of the time, um, you know, discusses around the, the transatlantic slave trade and, and African participation in, in, in that you know, very degrading and and in and inhuman traffic in, in in black bodies, have have often been framed um, in terms of, or, or I should rather say that um, white power on American plantations is often projected on these sites, right? So, for example, in the middle of the 18th century, an American or a British ship captain would say, Anamabo was where the Negroes were masters. All right. I would, I would end that section here. You know, you should completely rethink how power relations um, during that time, right? But the moment, you know, Europeans enter the Gold Coast, that was where the, the Negroes were masters, right? So once they're on the plantation or in the European colonies in the Americas, it was a completely different story, right? You know, something that I've been thinking about is who gets to tell our history? Because I find that I am missing at least content or history or reflections from people that were marginalized you know, especially when we think of pre-colonial Ghana, usually the history is from the point of view of the Europeans that were recording it, or if not, it's like the monarchy or the elites. So I wonder, you know, if there is some sort of recollection or records from the point of view of the people that were marginalized during that time. You know, and I wonder how that would impact the way we viewed pre-colonial Ghana or the way we view these sort of power structures. Have you come across any sort of records that is framed from the point of view of those that were marginalized or yeah. or anything like that? Yeah, that's 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 a very important question. Uh, question because our people were um, non literate, um, of course, with the exception of you know West African Muslims. By far, a lot of our non Muslim West Africans were non literate. So, and when you say non literate, can you explain what that means? Non-literate meaning um they couldn't they couldn't read and write. I mean we so 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 we don't call them illiterate because you know the term illiterate has all kinds of you know negative connotations. Negative connotation, yeah. right? <laughs> right. So 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 non-literate is more neutral. Yeah. Right. And we passed our information via oral tradition. O orally, yeah. orally. Mm -hmm. Um in non-Islamic West Africa, a lot of our interactions with with Europeans, because the Europeans were writing down everything, right? Because 
basically they were they were operating companies so they needed to keep accounts they needed to have log books account books if they were giving out goods on credit to african merchants african kings african nobles and so on they needed to uh, record that right so as historians uh, when we look at these log books and account books, they are not just trade book. They are not only recording trade, but a lot of times to um, maybe there may be disputes between different African kings or even within, you know, specific African kingdoms and, and, and states. So sometimes Europeans will be brought in to, to solve the conflicts because uh, they are seen as neutral, right? And and because of this, the Europeans also wrote down a lot of things, you know. All of these European records are also, they don't always understand the things they were recording or they don't always understand the things they were talking about, right? And so uh, we approach this, so, these sources very carefully. And, uh, but occasionally, uh, we find Africans also uh, writing stuff, uh, especially um, so in the 18th and 19th centuries, we have like missionary educated Africans or Africans who had been educated in Europe also writing things. But all sources are problematic, right? It's important to do what we call reading against the grain to obtain some of the local perspectives. So, for example, in the in the eighteen forties, there was a school teacher in um, in Usu who was um, sacked from her post, a mixed race school teacher, because she she was allegedly practicing fetishism, quote unquote, mm -hmm. right? So. If you encounter something like this, I mean, even just by using common sense, it tells you a story that mixed race Africans on the Gold Coast negotiated different beliefs. They practiced Christianity in addition to local religious beliefs. But then the sources just tell you that, oh, teachers were being fired because they practiced fetishism, right? But when you take that, every source should raise questions in your mind right or, or when you look at the source and you you should be able to raise a number of questions and the questions that you raise will help you to interpret uh that you know very uh, racist or biased european perspective right so that's right. that's what we call reading against the grain so the source will not necessarily tell you that oh they were practicing Christianity in addition to their indigenous uh, spiritualities, right? But firing somebody for fetishism tells you a lot, right? So, so these are some of the ways in which we try to get closer to the story, right? But then from the 19th century, there were lots of missionary educated Africans who were also writing stuff. They were writing ethnographies, and in some of the mission schools, they were even being asked to write essays on their deities in the mission schools. In the, 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 the I mean, I, I have school exercises of school kids who, who are being asked by their teachers and European teachers and mentors to write down the names of their deities. Wow, you know, that's you interesting. You have it in your collection? Or oh, you yeah, just yeah. seen I mean, that? No, I have I I I have it. Um, and oh I mean, wow, and even, that's interesting. I would love to know that. That's. So I mean, and 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 even some of my some of my ancestors, like some of my ancestors, um, in the in the eighteen, I mean, they had school school exercises from eighteen fifty five, and they were they were, they were being asked to write about their deities, their traditional festivals. When people got confirmed in church. They were asked to write special essays about their conversion. And in that, they 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 write in English, right? And in that they they explain. I mean, there's a there's there's lots of culture to unpack there. And and it tells us, you know, the, the kinds of uh like the reasons why some of these guys uh even converted to Christianity. And sometimes they were testing their deities, and somebody would say, I felt there was a guy. Who said he fell? His brother bought a horse. He fell from the horse, injured his head, and 
He wanted his deities to heal him. They couldn't. And he believed Jesus healed him. So he said, well, Jesus, if you heal me, I'll, I'll serve you. That's it. And mm, they got they got healed. And, and, and this guy interpreted his healing as a sign of God's power. And that's how he became Christian. I mean, personally, I'm, 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 I identify as um, agnostic, almost agnostic atheist. Uh, but what I tell people is these stories are very powerful. And I don't believe the missionaries had the power to um, indoctrinate. I think that that's like a sort of caricature, you know, like when people liken uh, the Basel missionaries and others to, for example, um, what white people did to Canadian boarding school kids, you know. I mean, like, I sent one of your friends a document in which, like, the girls' school, the Basel Mission girls' school in, in Accra, during Homo War, they, they, they allowed the, the girls to go home to go celebrate, right? Because the culture was so dominant that, like, you, you couldn't simply... If you tell them, if you tell the kids not to participate in their cultures, they'll stop coming to church, and you wouldn't have them. You wouldn't. You wouldn't be able to win their souls for Christ, right? That's interesting. You mentioned that because the episode I just did, like about the Basel mission and their impact, I know that they a lot of the times they taught the students in their local languages, so. Exactly. They, you know, that's an that surprised me honestly. I thought they would have taught them in English or whatever. They weren't even English, uh, excuse me, but you know, whatever European language. So it's it, it's interesting. Um, I talked about like the different techniques they use and even the different reasons why someone might have wanted to join the mission. You know, it, it wasn't that we just passively accepted things. There were economic reasons for some people to oh, join. Okay. There is sort of like nuance to that. And, um, you know, I also wonder, like, in terms of the oral tradition component in, turn it, in telling our pre-colonial history or talking about our traditions and customs, where does that come into play? And even as a historian, do you find yourself ever, you know, maybe talking to an elder or or learning things through via oral history to augment uh, the written documents that is available to us? Yeah, that's 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 an important question because oral traditions are not are not necessarily, I mean, and most, most people don't think about oral traditions this way, but oral traditions are not necessarily things passed on from one generation to the other going back forever. A lot of the time, oral traditions are invented in the heat of the moment um, in order to legitimize claims to a chieftaincy position or claims to uh, land or or, or to legitimize um, people saying that they were first comers. You know, when I say first comers, you know, in our context, if you want to claim privilege on the land, you have to claim that you are, your ancestors got there first, right? So during the, the consolidation of uh, colonial rule in Ghana, there were lots of social disruptions the cash economy was introduced, property became uh, land and other natural resources became extremely vulnerable. So, so people were inventing traditions in order to legitimize, because, you know, if they want to build a court or a school, they need land for comp so that they can pay compensation. So who, wh who, who gets the money? Who gets the compensation? Where does the money go? So people began to uh, invent a lot of things, right? So um, one of the things that influenced our oral traditions was missionary education, right? So um, a lot of our earliest histories, um, you know, with the exception of, again, Muslim West Africa, you know, 
a lot of our histories were written by missionary educated Africans, you know. So um these were some of the first generation of Christians, right? So people had to make sense of okay, how can I be an African and a Christian, right? So all kinds of stories were invented about how the the Ga people came from Israel or, or they were connected to biblical lands and how um you know the Akan people also have similar origins. And um so you see how the power of missionary education um sort of influenced a lot of narratives and also the nature of the colonial economy and how it it sort of monetized our system, also led to people inventing all kinds of traditions. So these ideas would feed back into subsequent oral traditions. So scholars call it the feedback loop in oral traditions, right? I mean, sometimes I talk to elders and and they are and, and they are telling me stuff uh, from um Carl Reindorf's History of the Gold Coast of Asante, written in 1895. They have not necessarily read Reindorf, but whatever Reindorf wrote passed into oral traditions, right? So, um, so oral traditions can be very problematic, right? Because a lot of the time, it's just book histories that had fed into the, the oral traditions. So, so sometimes I even prefer using uh, recorded oral traditions that goes back to, you know, the middle of the 19th century, right? Um, and then when you go back, you know, to more contemporary times, you realize that all these traditions changes, you know, whenever there's a dispute or the you know there are different claim claimants to a chieftaincy position or to property, then people begin to invent all kinds of things. All right. So um, <laughs> I'm I'm not I'm not saying oral traditions are are, are totally rubbish. Um, uh, you know, just like other sources of history, they are not problem free. You know, we shouldn't assume that oral traditions are these um, pristine, you know, ideas and narratives that were handed down, but they they can also be um, very problematic. Yeah. Yes, I think the gist basically is to view things with a critical lens, with a critical yeah. eye. <laughs> yeah, not necessarily that. You know, our oral tradition sucks or it's, it's not, or written history or European written history is superior, is that there are issues with different sources because of just, you know, people, humans being humans. Thank you so much, Herman, for like this very nuanced recollection of pre-colonial Ghana or what it means. Um, before we go, where can people connect with you online, whether it's social media or any sort of websites? Yeah, so um, I'm I'm always on Facebook because it's I think it's easier to use. So my my name on Facebook is um, Herman W Van Hesse, um, H E R M A N N W and Van Hesse. My last name V O N. Um, space h-e-s-s-e -S -S -E. yeah awesome thank you so much herman and thanks for for having me all right so thank you so much for listening to this episode on pre-colonial history um what i learned is i really want to know more about history from the point of view of marginalized folks, because I feel like that's what's often missing for me. I think one way of doing that possibly is learning from like our personal family history or the histories of our communities. That can be one way of doing that. But I don't know, just in general, like I want to be able to read different sources or listen to different sources or watch different sources online that doesn't just focus on like the monarchy or the elites or like 
what the European traders observed. You know what I mean? Like, I just want from the perspective of the marginalized folks, because we'll see, we'll see. Hopefully I come across something soon. Um, but yeah. Anyway, thank you for listening. You can follow Asasaba on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Asasaba Pod. You know, if anything resonated with you, if you have any feedback, hashtag Asasaba Pod wherever you listen. And yeah, I will catch you on the next episode. Bye-bye. <laughs>